Remember from our Chapter 3 screencasts that the atomic radius is the distance from the center of the nucleus to the outermost electron. If you measure the atomic radius of all the different elements on the periodic table, you'll find that there's a pattern in their size as you move across the periodic table as well as down the groups of the periodic table. As you move across the period, the atomic radius decreases. You can see in the picture that the elements that are over on the left-hand side are bigger, and as I move across to the right, those elements get smaller, and each of those little pink spheres represents the overall radius or size of each atom. The reason that these atoms decrease in size as you move across the periodic table is because of an increase in effective nuclear charge. The effective nuclear charge is the charge that the electrons feel from the pull of the nucleus. If you look at an atom of magnesium, Inside the nucleus, there are 12 protons and there are 12 neutrons, and those 12 protons have a charge of positive 12. But if you remember from quantum theory that the electrons in the atom are arranged in different energy levels. You have energy level 1, energy level 2, and energy level 3 that those electrons are organized in. And so these electrons that are notated in red effectively screen the outside electrons from the charge of the nucleus. They're kind of like a shield, and they prevent some of that positive charge from pulling on those electrons. So there are 10 inner electrons that shield the two outside electrons. So those outside electrons only feel a charge of two. Whereas a chlorine atom has the exact same number of inner electrons. There are 10 inner core electrons, but the nucleus of chlorine has 17 protons, or 17 positive charges. So if I take those 17 positive charges and I subtract out the 10 that are being screened by those electrons, then I have 7 effective nuclear charges remaining. So there's a much greater pull on the outermost electrons of chlorine than there are on the outermost electrons of magnesium. And that's what causes a chlorine atom, which would be here on the periodic table, to be so much smaller than a magnesium atom, which is over here on the left. Notice as you move down a group on the periodic table, the atomic radius of each atom increases. So if I look down group two, the alkaline earth metals, the radius, the size of each atom, gets larger and larger as I go down the group. And that has to do with the amount of energy that are in each orbital. So remember in period one on the periodic table, we're only in energy level one. But in period two, we're in energy level two. So we've added another layer of electrons. And that causes the radius to get larger and larger as we move down the table. Another trend on the periodic table deals with ionization energy. Now ionization energy is the amount of energy needed to remove an electron from an atom. So for example over here on the right is another magnesium atom with the 1s2 electrons and then 2s2 and 2p6 electrons around the outside and then on the very outermost electrons we have two third level electrons. If I wanted to remove this one electron from the atom I would need to add energy. If you see this equation at the bottom, this A represents any atom plus energy, so adding energy to pull that electron off would result in an ion that has a positive charge. And that ion that is positively charged is called a cation. Cations, by definition, are positively charged ions, and they are generally formed by all of the metals that are on the periodic table. Remember the zigzag that runs through the p-block on the periodic table. Anything to the left of that zigzag, those are metals. And all of those elements will form positively charged cations. They form cations by losing electrons in order to have the electron configuration of a noble gas. Notice in the diagram here to the right that a sodium atom has two first level electrons, eight second level electrons, and one electron in the third energy level. That can be written as an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. Now every single atom on the periodic table wants to have that noble gas configuration. That is that stable electron configuration that we talked about previously. So in order for a sodium atom to have the electron configuration of a noble gas, it would need to lose its outermost electron. And so its new electron configuration, after it lost the electron, would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. 
Notice that in red, that would be the noble gas configuration with those eight outermost electrons, or that octet of electrons that makes it stable. The symbol for a sodium cation would be Na with a single positive charge because it only lost one electron. Now when we form cations, the atomic radius decreases. Because I lost an electron, that electron cloud has gotten smaller, and now I have more positive charges to pull on all the electrons, creating a smaller ionic radius. When you look at a periodic table and you measure the ionization energy for each atom, there are also patterns that exist going across the table as well as down. As you move across the table, it's more and more difficult to remove electrons because of that greater effective nuclear charge. So remember that chlorine was much smaller than magnesium. Because it's smaller, those electrons are closer to the nucleus, and they're experiencing a greater pull by the nucleus, which makes it more difficult to remove that electron. Whereas the magnesium atom only had an effective nuclear charge of two, and so it's easier to remove the electron than chlorine, which had an effective nuclear charge of seven. As I move down the group, it's easier to remove those electrons, and that's because the atomic radius of the atoms gets larger. As the atomic radius gets larger, the electrons are farther and farther away from the nucleus, and so they're not experiencing as great of a pull by those positive charges in the nucleus, and that makes them easier to remove. So the first ionization energy was the energy needed to remove one electron, but the second and third ionization energies is the energy involved in removing additional electrons after I removed that first one. The second and third ionization energies are always higher than the first ionization energy. And that's simply because now I have an imbalance of charges. I have less electrons to balance out the positive charge of the nucleus, so it becomes increasingly difficult to remove additional electrons. When you analyze the values of the successive ionization energies, you'll find that the highest energy value occurs once that ion assumes its noble gas configuration. So we've already discussed that you would need to add energy in order to cause sodium to lose an electron. In fact, you would actually have to add 498 kilojoules of energy. Now, after I've removed that one electron, Notice that in order to pull off another electron, it requires an enormous amount of energy, over 4,500 kilojoules of energy, and that's a big jump. The reason why that jump occurs is because after sodium has lost one electron, it now has the electron configuration of a noble gas, and it's stable. So it would require a huge amount of energy to force it to become unstable again. Same thing is true with magnesium. Magnesium has two electrons that it can lose in its outer shells. So it requires 736 kilojoules to remove the first electron. Notice the second ionization energy is higher at over 1400 kilojoules. Once I try to remove that third electron, the amount of energy needed takes a gigantic jump, over 7700 kilojoules of energy needed. And again, that big increase in energy required is because magnesium needs to lose two electrons in order to become stable or to have the noble gas configuration. And if I try to remove three, now I'm going past that noble gas configuration, and magnesium would be unstable again. Another characteristic of atoms is their electron affinity. Electron affinity is the energy change that occurs when an atom gains an additional electron. When an atom gains an additional electron, it creates a negatively charged ion that we call an anion. So over here in this chemical equation, we have an atom which is represented by the letter A, and we're going to add an electron to that atom so that afterwards we have an atom that now has a negative charge and a certain amount of energy that is released. Because that energy is released, usually the energy change is a negative value. But there are some atoms that have an electron affinity that is positive, but that normally indicates that gaining an electron would be extremely unstable. The definition of an anion is a negatively charged ion. And anions are normally formed by all of the nonmetals on the periodic table. So again, go back to that zigzag through the P block. Anything to the right of that zigzag up in the top right hand corner of the periodic table will tend to gain electrons in order to form anions. 
atoms will gain these electrons in order to form that noble gas electron configuration again. Remember, the noble gases on the periodic table are the most stable elements, and so all the other elements on the periodic table are trying to achieve that same electron configuration. In the diagram at the top, you see an atom of sulfur with two electrons at energy level one, eight electrons at energy level two, and six electrons at energy level three. In order to become stable, sulfur can either lose all six of those outermost electrons, or it could simply gain two electrons into that outermost energy shell in order to have eight outermost electrons. And so in terms of energy, it's easier for sulfur to gain two electrons than it is for it to lose all six. So a sulfur atom has the ground state electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. After it gains two electrons, it now has the electron configuration ending with 3s2 and 3p6, which is the exact same electron configuration as argon, which is the noble gas that is nearest to sulfur. That gives sulfur a charge of negative two because it gained two electrons. The radius of the anion also changes by getting larger. So I've actually added extra electrons to that cloud and all those electrons are negatively charged so they will want to repel each other to get farther away and that causes that electron cloud to become larger. Just like ionization energy, electron affinity also shows some trends on the periodic table. Now if you were to look at the energy values for electron affinity, they're not quite as neat and tidy as ionization energy, but there is still some trends that exist. The amount of energy that is released is greater as I move across the periodic table. Remember that most of the time that energy is being released, so it will have a negative value, so the numbers actually get more and more negative as I move across the periodic table. In other words, all the atoms that are up on the right-hand side of the periodic table it's easier for them to gain electrons in order to become like a noble gas than it is for them to lose them. So because they have a higher attraction or affinity towards those electrons, then more energy will be released, producing a more negative electron affinity value. However, as I move down a group on the periodic table, the electron affinity decreases, so those values become less negative. This is due to the atomic radius of the atom. Those atoms at the bottom of a group are larger, it is more difficult to add electrons to the electron cloud because the incoming electron is actually farther away from the nucleus and therefore is going to experience a smaller pull by the positive charges in the nucleus. All of these electrons that we've been talking about being gained or lost are also known as valence electrons. The valence electrons are the outermost electrons that are in the highest energy level. Usually we also only count those electrons that are in the S sublevels or the P sublevels. So if you're looking at a periodic table, those elements that are in group 1 have one valence electron. Those that are in group 2 have two valence electrons. Remember that the transition metals have a lot of variety and they can lose different amounts of electrons, so we'll skip them. Those that are in group 13 have three valence electrons, group 14 has four valence electrons, and so on until we get over to the noble gases in group 18 that have eight valence electrons. And remember that that octet of electrons is what makes the atoms most stable. Now those valence electrons can be gained, can be lost, or can be shared in order to form compounds. And the number that are gained or lost depends on the relative location of the atom to the nearest noble gas. So all the alkali metals will tend to lose one electron and have a charge of plus one in order to be like the nearest noble gas. The alkaline earth metals will lose two electrons and form a cation with a charge of plus two. The halogens will tend to gain one electron to form that noble gas configuration, whereas the noble gases won't lose or gain any electrons because they already have that stable octet of electrons. The last trend that we find on the periodic table deals with electronegativity. 
So in the next chapter, we'll start talking about different kinds of chemical bonding, like ionic bonding and covalent bonding. And certain atoms will attract electrons more than other atoms in those chemical bonds. The measure of the ability to attract those electrons is called electronegativity. The electronegativity of an element is directly related to its ionization energy and its electron affinity. So elements that have very low ionization energies, like the alkali metals, will also have very low electronegativities. And elements that have very high electron affinities, like the halogen group, will also have very high electronegativities. So the pattern on the periodic table is basically the same for electronegativity. It increases as you go across each period and decreases as you go down the group. So the elements on the top right side of the periodic table will have the highest electronegativity, and the elements in the lower left-hand corner will have the lowest electronegativity. Keep in mind that the noble gas group will be the exception to this rule because the noble gases have no attraction to electrons, so most of them have no measured value for electronegativity. Trying to remember all of these different periodic trends can be tricky, so I would recommend that you draw yourself a little periodic table with a lot of different arrows around it in order to summarize those major periodic trends.